Hello again, guys. It is I at Free 700. We are back with some homebrew lore. This one was sent to me through one of my subscribers. He said that I should review this one. And uh, I did some research, and it turns out that this is actually from a YouTuber known as Valrak, uh, Chapter Master of Valrak. I always get that mixed up. And he did this called Reclaimers of Dorne. Now, I skimmed through it. So I'm going to read it to you guys so that way you guys know I'm not making it up when I'm saying my review of this, whether or not I like it, dislike it. That way you guys can't just have total dismissal of it going, Psh, what a crock of shit. No, like I'm going based on this and strictly this when it comes to this review. So here we go. Reclaimers of Dorne, Primarch, Rogel Dorne, makes sense. Successors of Imperial Fist, okay. Founding, the Ultima Founding, the Primaris. Successor chapters, nah. Number, a thousand, okay. Specialty, close combat. Oh yeah, we're getting some more Dark Templars. Homeworld, none. See, I, I kind of don't like this. They says none. I would have said something different, but that's just, that's nitpicking at its finest. So I'm not going to factor in for a review. Fortress Monastery, the Bastion of Pella. Star Fortress. Ooh. Aligned to the Imperium of Man. Colors is silver and gold. Okay. All the pictures I've seen of it were not gold. But, okay, silver and gold. War Cry. Reclaim what was taken. Avenge what is lost. The founding, the Reclaimers of Dorne were among the primary Space Ring chapters created during the Ultima founding at the direct order of Robert Gilliman and were created during the Indominus Crusade. The Reclaimers of Dorne were among the primary Space Ring chapters created during the Ultima founding of the Direct Order of Robert Gilliman. Throughout the Indominus Crusade, a group belonging to the gene lineage of Rogel Dorne, who were awakened from their long slumber in Magus Cal's stasis vaults, constantly petitioned the Primarch Gilliman to be allowed to search for their gene sire. They knew that if the Imperium was to survive, it could only be accomplished through the strength of Rogel Dorne. As the Indominus Crusade came to a close and Robert Gilman began to break up his forces, the Reclaimers of Dorne were founded as part of the Ultima founding. They took to the stars to search for their gene father and reclaim what was taken. To aid them in this quest, the Reclaimers of Dorne were given the mighty star fort, Bastion of Reclamation, to serve as their fortress monastery during long search amongst the furthest reaches of the galaxy. Um, this sentence here I think is kind of pointless. It's literally redundant, like, <laughs> this is just, like, filler. I'm not joking, this is literally a filler sentence. It makes no reason why this sentence is here. You already said that they were founded near the uh, Ultima founding. They were found once the crusade was over. So, this sentence, the crusade's over, Robert Gilman founded them, like, that. that's literally a waste of a sentence. And you could have probably put something else in there, like maybe their icon, their livery, what their icon stands for, something like that. Also, it's kind of, um, so I would have said for Homeworld, I would have just said fleet-based chapter, because that seems to be what this is. And as a fleet-based chapter, that makes sense to me. I do kind of find it odd, though, that they would have a fortress monastery for being a fleet-based chapter, but... Who knows, maybe they uh, search for somebody by staying in one spot of the galaxy and just hold a giant megaphone to the emptiness of space. Who knows? The chapter is led by the Chapter Master. Okay. Chapter Master has his own specialist honor guardians who answer to his command alone. They are known as the Protostoi Guard. Oh, okay. That's a little Greek there. Ooh. The chapter is split into individual phalangites, companies. Okay, that's interesting. Each phalangite is led by a captain. Hmm. Phalangites is a lot like phalange in uh, anatomy and physiology. So it would have been interesting if you said that this chapter had only five companies, as in a hand. That would have been interesting, but I don't think he says that anywhere. The chapter has the rank of blade master. Whoever holds this title is held in high respect by all members of the chapter. The blade master is the chapter's most skilled warrior. He's normally placed within the first phalangite. The blade master is put forward to settle any individual duels with other chapters. 
The Reclaimers of Dorne have a sacred tradition of claiming the weapon wielded by the opponent if the Blade Master wins in an honor duel. Well, that could cause some issues with some Space Marine chapters. Like, uh, there was one um, thing that happened with the Marines Malevolent where they had a duel with the Black Templars, and upon winning, he took everything. The guy's power armor, everything, because it was a duel to the death. And the Black Templars were pissed because that has a lot of meaning to them. The armor, the weapons, they have meaning. So being a chapter that takes people's weapons, that might get you on the shit list of a few people. Also, I do like this, though, and how there's a Blade Master. Because any uh, son of Dorne, their chapters usually hold these meetings where they do competitions against each other. So this does make sense. This is really good. I like that a lot. And I do like on how he says it's normal for them to be in the first company, the first Phalangite. But there are probably exceptions. There probably is going to be an exception. So if you were to role play as this on tabletop, you could be like, oh, we're the eighth company or we're the, I'm sorry, Phalangite, Phalangite. Got to get immersed into this lore here. Got to be the eighth Phalangite. Chapter Master Valrak, High Reclaimer of the Chapter. Hermalos, Captain of the Toasty Guard. I'm, I'm just going to call him Krusty Toast. Jesus. Damius Sigis Hell. Oh, oh man, I can't pronounce that. Blade Master, stern exemplar promoted for legendary conflicts with Iron Warrior scum at Cornisha's stronghold. Corto Katonarn. Oh boy, I cannot read these. Lord Reclaimer of the First Phalangite. Hmm, he didn't say anything about a Lord Reclaimer. Hmm. Okay, we have some gaps in the lore now. Honorable strategist involved in several suppre uh, suppressions of the Iron Warriors encirclements of the Pyrenees Tertius. Halbros Peridius, Chapter Ancient, devoted tactician, sorely tested by many sieges against the apostate filth at Baromula Reach. Argunxtus Sura, Redemptor Dreadnought. Ooh, I like Dreadnoughts. I have a soft spot for Dreadnoughts. Steely leader defined by legendary actions against rebel outposts at Colorax Minnow. Terran Apollon, chief apothecary, holder of the Gladio Pugna, a power sword carved from the armor of lost brothers of the Iron Cage. Ooh, that's old lore right there, Iron Cage. Whew. Fleet Star Fortress Pella. Okay, this is just the name of all the ships that they've got. Okay. Little unnecessary, but nice. What is this? Okay, I guess this is some like tips and trivia about the homebrew. Okay. The Star Fortress hovers around the gas giant. The gas giant. Not what kind of gas giant, just the gas giant. Okay. Acting as the vanguard of defense, blocking intruders from entering the system, much of the gas giant protects Pella and the other worlds from asteroids. The Star Fortress protects those worlds before they can even be laid upon in siege. What? A gas giant? How the fuck does a planet, a gas giant, protect a space station? And how does it protect them from asteroids? Because usually gas giants have a ring around them, usually. So that means that there's probably a lot of asteroids near the Star Fortress. Uh, I don't get that. That, that kind of went way over my head. It could be implied it has a Dark Age of Technology relic within it, which draws all warp traffic to it when they leave the warp, forcing outsiders into its range first to investigate all who enter. So, okay, now we see why the gas giant is so important. It doesn't explain what it is. It could be the Star Fortress, but I highly doubt it. It's probably the planet, the gas giant. The gas giant probably has something that's pulling things to it. That makes sense. See, now we're getting some explanation. I imagine the system of Pella and every fortification of Pella almost being like Constantinople. So would this be like where in the galaxy? I don't get it. Like, is this going to be like in the choke point of the Great Rift? Is this going to be like 
in the middle of McCrag or something? Like, where would this system be? Rings upon rings of defenses leading to the true prize within, but all of them locked behind layers upon layers. What? What is this talking about? In space, the first ring is the Star Fortress itself, an ancient powerful battle station of immense power which governs all ships which enter their space, acting as both a portmaster and a battlement. Then you have other stations situated among the asteroid belts, then the planetary defenses, then the fortress upon each world, which is really five fortresses, each one encompassing another. Okay, so five worlds in total in the solar system. And then the heart, the citadel at the very core of each world. Okay, before we get any further, this is a convoluted mess. I feel like this could have been explained a lot easier. But it's really not. It's kind of jumbled out of order, if you know what I mean. Like, this would have probably been better down here. And this would have been probably better up here describing what the Star Fortress is and why it's there. This part kind of doesn't make sense. Like, rings upon rings of defenses leading to the true prize within? Um, not really. If you're telling me that the main home of your chapter is on the outermost layer, in other words, the front line of the system, it's not really rings behind rings, is it? It's more like everything's at the front, and once you get through, sure, there's other defenses that are maybe as strong, but you just obliterate the Astartes. So now there's no more Astartes you have to worry about in the rest of the system from what it sounds like. So it kinda makes no sense. I do like it though that he's taking um, history inspirations from Constantinople, I do like that. I don't know enough about it to say is this accurate or not. I got no idea. So, homeworld, Pella. Other worlds relevant as well, but this is the capital. Star Fortress of Seleucia. Oh, okay, so here comes some more of that Greek stuff. Hangs in orbit, takes the name of Seleucus, the Seleucid Empire, a general of Alexander the Great, and a successor kingdom to his empire. That is absolutely true. That did happen. Gifted to them by Gilliman, it took a total of 75 years to repair and rebuild this station from its state of disrepair. I actually want to add that Valrak himself was frustrated with the time it took to be restored, as despite the Forge world helping... He often saw the tech priests as being overly religious and being extremely inefficient in their work, even completing things which weren't relevant to its construction. First, in order to appease the machine god, this includes his own tech marines. Valrak himself is from the era of the emperor. He knows the tech priest be crazy. Lol. Okay. Makes sense because after all, if um, the Primaris were in cryostasis or in stasis, for 10,000 years, it would make sense that they would be a little cautious and a little annoyed with the superstition that the Mechanicus has now, 10,000 years later. So yeah, that would make sense. Um, Pella itself, a world with many ecosystems and geographical features on the continent of Graysa. There are a fortress they constructed while work was being done. Uh, to Seleucia, the Fortress of Agi. Once the Star Fortress was completed, this mountainous fortress became the home of local military forces, as well as sections of it being dedicated to training and housing of initiates, chapter serfs, and neophytes' unfinished marines. Only when someone becomes a full space marine or a fully inducted serf may they ascend to the heavens and join the chapter itself in orbit. There are five other companions Valrak had who crossed the Rubicon with him. Where the fuck did the Rubicon come from? Sergeants and Marines who were under his command at the Battle of Terra, okay, 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 who walked the path with him, they became his counsel, his friends from before, his captains, they were the ones who give him counsel to raise voice, their disunity when necessary if they believe the chapter has gone wayward. This is based on Alexander the Great's actual cadre, which would later become the Daidochi. Okay, so I guess it's called the Daidochi. I don't know why I didn't just say Daidochi, dash, and then explain everything. But that's interesting, so now you're getting a little bit more of the uh, culture and the implications of what it means to be a reclaimer of Dorne. That's interesting. One of the things that prompts Valrak's vision for a crusade across the stars to reclaim that which is lost to fulfill their duty to the Emperor now, that he cannot lead such a crusade himself, is one of his companions in the entire Fifth Company are wiped out. Wait, what? What? That sentence was, whoa, what? what just happened there? One of the things that prompts Valrak's vision 
for a crusade across the stars to reclaim that which was lost. To fulfill their duty to the Emperor now that he cannot lead such a crusade himself. What? These are like two separate sentences. What, what the fuck is he going on about? Is one of his companions. And the entire Fifth Company are wiped out. What? He receives news of this shortly after the completion of Solution. The first act of this Grand Crusade is to offend their fallen brother as he remembers his longest serving comrade, his friend, who is yet unnamed, who always pressed him and everyone around them hardest, ever since the First Great Crusade. To push further and farther as he really did believe in the manifest destiny of mankind and the Emperor of Mankind, though not as a god. Well, okay. This needs to be looked at, grammatically speaking. Like, this first sentence here gave me a fucking stroke. That was just a total stroke. I, I'm still having a hard time piecing together what he's trying to say here. Poof. Wow, that was a stroke. Like, the second half of this made sense. It was fine. It was just that really gave me a fucking brain aneurysm. If such an event does happen, which threat do you want to have wiped out the company? Gene Steelers, Chaos, Tyranids, Orcs, Drukari, etc. Are there any specific rules you mentioned? Oh, and the seventh company and second company of grand victories are reported back to him prior to the news of what happened to fifth company, as it takes sometimes years for words to travel. Seems like things are going great until, uh, what is this dialogue? What the fuck? I do like this. This is more like a community asking question. What do you want to happen? That sounds cool, but I don't think it belongs on this spreadsheet because... This is supposed to be the lore. Like, what the fuck is this all about? This is, again, a question. I'm guessing his subscribers are commenting on this or something. I don't know. But needs to get wiped out and put on, like, a separate sheet or something. I do kind of find this a little bit annoying. Because it sounds like a bad text message being sent. Instead of a fully developed story about what these grand victories are or anything like that. It's just lazy writing where he's just going, oh, and by the way, uh, lol, we just killed the Tau, teehee. It's like, what, what? Explain, like, please go more into it. All right, so we have some years here. The first test of steel on the most Western fringe of Pacificus, light years from any realm even nearby the Reclaimers of Dorn, a shadow would begin to encroach on the realm of Segmentum Pacificus. The astropaths of the, across the region began speaking of a shadow beginning to surround them. In the fading light of the Astronomicon, worlds that fell silent behind the shadow would never be heard from again. Raving cults of the vile Xeno-worshipping cults would begin to emerge with greater frequency. The Reclaimers of, of Dorne dispatched the 2nd, 5th, 6th, 7th... Wait, I thought the 5th was dead. Okay of Primera Space Marines to fight against the rise of these cults across Pacifica, launching interventions across a dozen subsectors. The first and ninth companies would be dispatched, with Valrak himself at their lead, to venture directly into the shadow which had fallen over the warp. Captain of the first company, Callus, a man who served with Valrak on the walls of Terra itself while serving in the Imperial Fist, and one of his most trusted companions, would be the more cautionary of the two. In the planning of their reconnaissance and force of the darkened subsectors, they decided to avoid the regions where the shadow was most harsh. Astropaths and librarians were driven to their limits as the primary force made its way into the shade. What they would find were a slew of dead, lifeless worlds, stripped clean of all life and most resources. The name of the enemy now descending upon the Pacificus, as known to them well. Tyranids. Okay. So this is some short stories, interesting enough, but Callus, Callus, Callus. Was that mentioned up here at some point? Let's look at it. I don't see a Callus. Yeah, there's no mention of a Callus. Okay. I knew I wasn't, like, going insane. Like, there was no mention of it. Like, you would think it would be Hermalos, since he's the captain of the Chris Predestoy uh, guard, that he would be in charge that he would be the captain of the first company, but I guess not. Some random guy named Callus. Okay. Scale of emergency not yet known, but Chief Librarian Udemus would demand that they travel as far east as they could in order to send word immediately to anyone who could still hear that a new threat indeed arrived. 
The Redeemers, uh, under the stewardship of their chapter master, would jump eastwards, looking for a clearing in the shadow that descended all around them. When they emerged, their astropaths dead or dying, and their librarians themselves haggard and worn, having done battle against the enforced silence. Truly, in fact, a trillion, trillion whispers of a dark enemy of man silencing all around them. They immediately sent out word what was to come, their enemy. For the first time of true note revealed itself, the new fleet was given the name High Fleet Pytho. Knowing that they needed time to recover, the fleet remained stationary for several weeks as their psychers were given a chance to recover. Okay. Aboard the battle barge Antipater, however, they would receive word that tendrils from the beast had already made their way deeper into the realm of Pacificus than imagined. Many of these worlds, the cult of the Star Chosen had infested, were now falling dangerously close to the shadow. What was worse was that the second and seventh companies had taken significant losses on the worlds of Indrisha, where they had been ambushed and deceived by a world which had become wholly dedicated to the perverse and depraved cult. Strike cruisers in orbit led by Perseus and the Harp would launch exterminatus on the planet's surface by atmospheric incendiary torpedoes. However, it was a world lost to an enemy they had not even known, and the second and seventh company would be removed from the line of duty for a decade, at least to rebuild themselves in the wake of their losses. Okay. Captain Langarus of the second company, as well as Captain Dosimus of the seventh, Survived the encounter, offered services of themselves and their command staff to any other company in need of what they knew was a time of strife. This would open up a massive theater of operations, spreading across thousands of light years. When the word given out, regiments of Astra Militarum, as, long as, as well as several fleets from the Hydrofer, would be dispatched. The response Valric himself knew appeared to be disorganized by its very nature, and this would mean a true organized response would be required. The yeah, Astartes chapters of the Flying Warhawks and the Vindication Guard would be the first to answer the call, located locally. The Warhawks appear to be a chapter who had yet received their reinforcements from Indomitus, and the Vindication Guard had been formed, much like the Reclaimers of Dorne, after a successful campaign by their own chapter master and founder, Rodurigus Crassus. Okay, good, right, we're near the end. Much later in the campaign, the Guardians of the Covenant, a successor to the Dark Angels, would also become involved. The Crusade's fate was kept hidden from the Greater Imperium, and the Administratum denied any link to it. Chaos Space Marine raids increased afterwards, empowered by these new chapters who had fallen. All that is known is that 800 years after the Crusade began, those who remained loyal to the throne returned from the warp with their purity and sanity intact. One of the chapters to return was the Vorpal Swords, led by Chapter Master Convac Lan, he now saw that the crusade, what the crusade truly was, a devious trap laid by those influenced by chaos. He and those who followed him set their sights on the legacy of Basilius, who had now been long deceased but still worshipped as a saint. Wait, what? <laughs> Chapter Master Conrad Vlan declared the saint as a false saint and an apostle of chaos. Wait, what? <laughs> what? You just said that they're a saint, now you're saying it's a false saint? Wait a second, this is convoluted as shit. What is this? In less than a year, every known shrine to the false saint was destroyed and his followers were massacred. The saint's bones and relics were then placed in derelict crater and launched directly into a nearby star. <laughs> oh my god, organization, please. Like, what the fuck? So now we're in the review part, and man, this thing is not that good. I'm very surprised people actually like this. Um, there was no pictures on this, so I had to actually find it online, pictures of it. Like we have um, these images here. Again, most of the images I've seen, like this one in particular, it seems orange with silver, not gold with silver. This looks like gold with silver. That looks like gold with silver to me. So either everybody's getting it wrong, even Chapter Master Valrak himself, or he may have simply forgot what he wrote in his own lore, which is that this is it. Gold and silver. Easy peasy. We have some more photos here that I decided to maximize in case you guys want to see better detail. I love on how this guy's got rid of, like his abs showing and stuff, whereas everyone else doesn't. I thought that was funny. 
I know this was an artist. This wasn't Chapter Master Valrak himself. Let's close all these fucking tabs. Now, lore perspective. Wow. There is a whole lot of nothing going on in here. And that actually drives me a little upset. Because specialty, close combat. Was there anywhere in these short stories, these collections of ideas, did we come across anything about that? No. So far, all I'm seeing is that they may actually specialize in fleet combat, space combat. That would make sense. Because all I'm seeing right now written here is space, 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 space. There's also some lore inconsistency, like... I guess the fifth fleet recover. I mean, the fifth company recovered by this point that this happens. Um, he doesn't really give too many dates exactly. There's a lot of issues here. There's a lot. Like he says, there's no home world, but then he says Seleucia is the home world, essentially. Like, what the fuck? If your shit is going to be fleet based, which is what it seems to be. Then just say fleet based. They may have a star fortress that they go to. Great, that's awesome. But they have another fortress built onto Seleucia or Pella. Pella, that's the name of the planet. Pella. And look, he even puts it here Homeworld, Pella. <laughs> we scroll up. Homeworld, none. <laughs> Holy shit. That was an oversight. Whoops. Teehee, oopsies, XD. God damn. Oh, man. This is not that good. I also wish you explain here what he means by the strength of Rogodorn is what the Imperium needs. How? Why? Where would they come up with that idea? It's interesting, but why? Like, what and where are they getting this idea from? Is there something that Dorn did in per that these guys have seen in person before they were locked in stasis that just made them know not only is Dorn my um, father, but he is the best thing to ever happen to the Imperium. What exactly is giving them this idea? Why? Why are they so hell-bent on finding Dorn? Because nowhere here does he describe that. Also, we don't really know much about the history of these people, the culture they have. All we know is that they seem to have some Greek inspiration, a lot of Alexander the Great inspiration, some Constantinople inspiration, but we don't know, like, the culture. We don't know how their world is as far as, like, the people are. Are they hardy people? Are they merry people? Are they, what, are they driven? Are they stoic? What is it? No explanation. So as far as we know, this is just literally just orange and silver space marines, and that's it. Like, there's nothing that's making them unique in their own thing. There's nothing creative about that. As I said, there's some redundancy here. Like, there's some stupid senses that just make no sense. Um, I don't mean to be too hard on this. It's just some of these senses... I'm not saying you have to be an English major... And for all I know, Chapter Master Valrak could be, like, Swedish or something, so he doesn't know how to type correct English sentences. But some of these sentences gave me fucking strokes. So, definitely gotta work on that. Unfortunately, he doesn't put too much here. I kind of wish he put a little bit more. Like... The Phalangites was an interesting idea. It's like, okay, so they're called Phalangites instead of companies. Okay. The Kratos Stoy Guard, interesting. He didn't describe, though, what this Honor Guard would be consistent of. Maybe there's something unique about these Honor Guardians in general. Maybe they all use shields. Maybe they're all like the Sanguinary Guard, where they have these huge fuck-off swords with this golden paint. Nowhere does he say that. Nowhere does he say about how each company may have different icons in different colors nope we don't get anything we don't get anything at all we just get tiny little beats of uh, ideas that are put here which is cool the blade master one's great this one's great but it could probably be expanded upon could have probably been done better it's like fuck 
I'm looking at this and I'm just like, it has potential, but I don't think this guy put in that much uh, thought into it. It seems like a jumble of thoughts. It seems like a mess, like spaghetti. It's just a mixed twisting of ideas and lore, but nothing actually nice. It's not like a big junk. It's not like a big chunky meatloaf. Instead, it's just this weird fucking spaghetti that I'm just having a very hard time picking through. Like occasionally I find a meatball here, like the Blade Master. And then other times I just get random bland noodles that just make no fucking sense. Like he talks about all these characters, which is cool, but none of them pop up. In fact, while he's talking about all those characters up there and giving like one sense about them, we all of a sudden get introduced to another character, Callus, and it's like, wait, he should be up here then. If he's in charge of the first company, he's got to be important. He's got to be something. But we don't get anything about that. So it's just disappointing. God, this is really disappointing. This is why I wanted to read through all the lore first. I know it took a lot of time, like, reading all this shit. Because reading, like, out loud to people, I'm not too good at that. I'm not some voice actor who can sit there like um, Christopher Lee with his beautiful voice that he's got and make it intriguing to listen to because of his voice. No, I'm, I don't have that. But I'm reading it for you guys before I review it so you guys can see I'm not making this shit up. So that way, if this guy does have fans who are deeply fanatical about him and they come onto my video and start bitching about it, I'm just going to say, dude, you saw as well as I saw, there's not good enough stuff here. There's more effort put into this. There is a lot of effort put into this, which I really, really appreciate. And I wish you do more of this. If he did all of this effort onto up here, onto here, onto here, this would have been way better. Way, way, way better. This section is pretty much all trivia and extra tidbits of knowledge and tiny little minor stories. And even some of these minor stories, they don't get expanded upon. Like, what the fuck? How is Chaos influencing the High Fleet of Tyranids? Why would Chaos even use the High Fleet? What? What is so interesting about this High Fleet? Can you describe some of the things that they may be? Maybe they're known as Pytho because they're all snake-like or something. Who knows? He doesn't explain anything. He just kind of says it and we just have to take it as is. And it's really aggravating. God. Like, we could even go on a Wikipedia page right now, which, as you know, I usually hate Wikipedia pages. And we could look up some obscure chapter in their trivia section, which is this section, would be smaller than the two sentences they would put about the chapter in general. If your homebrew lore comes out like this, where your trivia section is three times bigger, if not half of the whole goddamn page of your whole thing, then that's not good. That's not good at all. Because you're giving me a bunch of random facts, but you're not giving me something that's well-designed, well-structured, something that's well put together. It's like a canvas. If someone goes around looking at your art piece and goes, okay, so what's up with your painting? What makes it so cool, so unique? What abstract things have you put into it? Well, you know, I put a little bit of magenta here on the corner, and I put a little bit of um, lime green on this corner. Okay, but do they have any shapes? Is there any overarching thing that they come together and form this unique, visual, stunning thing? No, it's just cool colors put onto a canvas. That's what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing a lot of cool little tidbits, but nothing structure, nothing sound, nothing put together that would make a good story. Nothing that would make good lore. Nothing that would make an interesting homebrew. Oh, man. I was actually excited when I saw it was 10 pages because I was like, 10 pages? Woohoo! Let's get some lore, baby! But now I'm looking at it and I'm going, damn. If you had stuck with four pages and you did it well, 10 out of 10, easy. But because you made this all jumbled up, we're not even picking about the grammar. We're just picking about how jumbled and how some of this information is just pure garbage. 
And it's just, what's the point? Why did you do it? I don't understand it. Like, I want to know if he's talking about the Star Fortress or if he's talking about the planet. And why is the planet just called a gas giant? Why does it not have a name? There's, there's so many questions. So many questions that I can't really say that this is complete. That's the worst part, right? There's so much words written about this homebrew, but it's not done yet. It's not complete. It's just minimalistic as can be. Like, I like that he puts this whole story here, which is cool. But then all it does is it just goes, okay, so this happened, this happened, this happened. No specifics, no explanations on it, nothing. It's like, damn, dude. I think for a fair review of this is that it's disappointing. I was expecting a lot better. I was expecting a lot more when I saw how many words were on here and how many like pages it was. When I saw the very beginning, I was like, damn, we were worrying for some good shit. Look how organized this is. But then I scroll down and I see that you, you fucked up your own lore. Like you put Homeworld none, but then you put down here Homeworld's Pella. Like, come on. It's a mess. It needs cleaning up. I would say it's a 4 out of 10. I want to give it a 5 to say it's average, but... Fuck. It needs cleaning up. Like, oof, it needs a lot of cleaning up. God damn. I feel disgusting saying that too, because... I was actually excited for this. I was like, damn, this is going to be a lot of lore. I like interesting ideas. I like interesting stuff. Homebrew should be amazing, awesome things. But this was disappointing. This was honestly disappointing. Like, I guess the person who's writing this down is expecting me to fill in the gaps with my own thoughts, which isn't. That's not the way that works. <laughs> that doesn't work that way. You can't write a story and expect me to fill it for you. Like, God, you can't just put a bunch of information down and expect it to be organized the moment that I read it out loud. No, you got to organize it yourself in a way that makes sense. Like, holy crap. Do you think George Lucas would have gotten far if he just did his movies in random order? Yeah, Star Wars Episode 3, that happened. Now we're going to do Episode 6. Uh, now we're going to do Episode 1. Then we're going to do Episode 5 and 2. No, he did it in a concise way to illustrate a story, to illustrate a point, a structure. Sure, it was a little weird starting in the future and then working your way into the past, but it worked. It paid off. It illustrated a much greater story, and it drew more intrigue and more questions. But this, this is just a convoluted mess. This is... This part here, I would say, is a little pointless. I would say this is pretty damn pointless. Because naming every ship, that's just whatever. That really doesn't affect anything. Like, I guess if I was playing a Gothica Armada or whatever, I would be using this, but... God damn. I'm going to have to end this here because this is disappointing. I was expecting more. I was expecting more is what I could say. Again, specialty close combat, but we got no story about close combat. I guess the closest combat they get is with the torpedo launch. Like, I don't know what to say about this. I'm done. This has been Freer 700. I'm out. Please, guys, send me more of your homebrew. Or link me some homebrew that exists that I have no idea exists, like this one. Because I'm always interested in hearing abstract ideas. After all, my whole channel is built upon lesser-known lore, like Marines Malevolent, the Death Sights, the Ghoul Stars, the... Um... 
fuck, I'm just so fucking disappointed. But this has been Free 700, I'm out. See you guys next time.